<clears throat> okay, so let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming. This is the Drupal Distributions uh, Leveraging Open Source Solutions session. It just rolls right off the tip of the tongue. Um, and we've got some, some real leaders today in the area of Drupal Distributions, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, but first I wanna just talk about uh, the topic of distributions uh, a little bit and provide some background. So what are Drupal distributions and why are they important, right? So there's a lot of different ways to think about Drupal distributions. There are technical explanations, there's kind of a business need explanation. And the way that I like to think about them is that when you install Drupal core, uh, you get a tool for building websites, which is really powerful, but it's still a tool for building a website or a web application. So if you want a tool, you know, if you want a purpose built solution, you've still gotta go ahead and configure and set things up, so it's not really ready to go. A Drupal distribution is powered by Drupal core, but it is purpose built for a particular purpose. So once you install a Drupal distribution, you've got an application that's ready to manage your conference or your intranet uh, or your publishing site. And so uh, there, you, know, you can look at them as an accelerator to site building, so they make it quicker to build a site. And you can also look at distributions as, as kind of independent from Drupal in the sense that while they happen to be powered by Drupal, they have a specific purpose um, and they're, you know, they provide value out of the box. So a little bit of history about distributions. Uh, distributions actually go way back in Drupal, uh, as early as 2006, and you know, certainly there was discussion earlier, but uh, there's a blog post that's often referenced by Dries where he uh, referred to distributions uh, as the future of Drupal, and he said, Drupal 5, the upcoming Drupal release, will have better support for Drupal distributions. Now this is true, uh, and of course, you know, Drupal 7 is the current uh, core version of Drupal. We we're talking about Drupal 8. That post was done at the time of Drupal 4.7, so quite a while ago. Uh, and there were improvements uh, in Drupal 5 for distributions, but really it's taken a while for distributions to, to become more mature. Uh, a couple key milestones in the maturity of distributions uh, that we should mention are in 2009, the features in Drush Make projects were created, and so those are two really fundamental tools uh, for you know technical components for building distributions, and then only recently, uh, you know, this month, full distribution packaging on Drupal.org was uh, was made possible. And so what that means basically is that previously you could develop a distribution on Drupal.org, but there were a lot of limitations around what kind of distributions could be downloaded from Drupal.org. So if you had patches to modules or if you had third-party libraries like jQuery UI, you couldn't make that package distribution available for download on Drupal.org. And so people had to host them separately or even package them separately, which was, you know, added some complexity to the process of building distributions. Um, so you know, it's, it's kind of taken a while for us to, to, to get to where we are today, and really there's, there's still a bright future ahead for Drupal distributions. I do wanna highlight uh, that last step, because this is really one of the biggest milestones um, towards distributions, uh, the, the, the packaging enhancements that were completed recently. Uh, these were uh, funded by the companies you see here, a couple represented today in the panel, and it's, it's really easy to complain, you know, and say, oh, I wish Drupal.org was better, it doesn't do distributions the way I need it to, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, you know, kind of complain, but you know, the, a lot of folks worked on this, um, and in particular, these companies stepped up to sponsor. So that's uh, that was really great. So thanks to to everybody who sponsored that initiative and helped work on it. Yeah, little applause, right? Moving distributions forward for everybody, and for some reason, the slide appears again. Uh, so the bottom line there is that it's taken a long time for distros to mature, and they're still maturing. Uh, so now in reverse alphabetical order by a company name, I will let the panelists introduce themselves. We're very organized today. Reverse alphabetical. Starting, with, starting with phase two technology, oh, okay. in case you didn't have that off the top of your head. I didn't know if we were uh, going by last name, because that would be <laughs> also me. Um, yet, uh, so there's two folks here from phase two, and I'll let Karen introduce herself. Um, my name's Jeff Walpole, I'm the CEO of Phase Two, um, and our company maintains uh, currently four major distributions, uh, Open Public, Open Publish, uh, Open Atrium, and uh, Managing News. So uh, those are the four that we're actively involved in, and we've been doing uh, Drupal distributions for over three years now. We launched uh, Open Publish at DrupalCon DC in 2009. Um, so we've been uh, through the rocky road of doing it one way, and coming back and doing it a different way, and uh, we actually have had quite a bit of experience on our technical team with that. So um, I think I'll let Karen introduce herself and her role, because it's important here too. Okay, 
How's that? Oh, there we go. Um, I'm Karen Borcher, and I'm the director of products at Phase Two. So my job is to manage the um, roadmaps and teams um, who are developing and building these products, as well as the um, community management aspect of what we do um, in helping to get more documentation, training, videos, um, and help around the distributions. Um, so managing kind of the whole ecosystem of the distribution, not just the technical build, um, and that's. that's Part of our commitment um, as a company with the distributions is just not to um, build them and put them out there, but to try to um, look at the support around them more holistically. So that's that's my job. And then uh, level ten. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Tom McCracken. I'm the director of Level Ten, and we maintain a distribution called Open Enterprise. And uh, we actually launched it underneath a different name, kind of a convoluted name called Eyesight Essentials back in uh, just before DC. Um, and kind of, it's been an interesting, through the four revisions, kind of an interesting winding road that I think uh, just been through a lot of the same things. Uh, my name is Mike Shaver and I work at the uh, uh, Intel Open Source Technology Center. Um, and so I'm actually, we don't do a distribution, we just use them. Um, for a lot of the um, open source projects that we, our, our developers, uh, are participating in. So we have experience with um, using COD for a number of uh, conference um, uh, sites, as well as uh, Open Atrium for some of our internal collaboration. And then, um, and then we've been looking at other ones as well, just for, for other uses, so. Aquia starts with an A, so we're at the end of the alphabet. Uh, my name is Mark O'Brien. I'm the Vice President and General Manager for Distributions at, uh, at Aquia. And uh, my history actually is uh, very competitive against uh, proprietary solutions with uh, the open source space. I'm still active with a project called OpenProj, and there's about, uh, they compete against a Microsoft Project, and I think it's kind of a pattern about going against the, the open source uh, via vis-a-vis -vis proprietary vendors. Um, and OpenProj was downloaded about 125,000 times last month. And so, you know, there's many proof points out there, Drupal being another one. And uh, the expectations for me with, with distributions is to have that same kind of effect in the marketplace. But with Acquia, everyone probably knows, has Commons and, and COD. And, um, and I will let Ezra continue on with the intro. Sure. So I'm Ezra Barnett Gildas Game, and I'm the technical lead for the distribution team within Acquia. Uh, I'm also the project maintainer for the conference organizing distribution and the commons distribution of Drupal uh, for co uh, conferences and uh, external community websites. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking to all the panelists today. I think this is going to be a good conversation. So let's get started. Uh, the first d uh, question that we've got here is how do distributions get started, right? Um, do they come from client work? Is there some seed funding? Or is there just kind of a magical community initiative and people get together and, and build them? So. Um, I guess I'll start out with, with Karen. Do you want to start that one? Sure. Um, the answer is, is really that those can, all three of those things can, can start a distribution. Um, at phase two, um, Jeff can actually talk more about how, how our distributions were started with client work. Um, but a lot of our work at phase two is in specific verticals, um, specifically in the, in the online publishing vertical and in the government vertical. Um, so we've built a lot of expertise at um, which is really at the heart of a distribution, is expertise um, in the module choice and the configurations and what's needed specifically for a site um, for a group, a specific group of, uh, of, of users. Um, and so a lot of it has come from client work. Um, there, you know, Open Atrium is, is not one that we built. Um, it's, it's one that was built by Development Seed and, and was done some with client work and then also some with grant funding actually um, through the um, Knight Foundation. Um, and then there are, you know, also community initiatives that, that start, um, start some of them too. But Jeff, do you want to talk any more about, about how ours got started? Sure. Um. Yeah, so as, as Karen said, I mean, we, we built uh, Open Public and Open Publish with, uh, with work we'd done in the industry sector. So Open Public, um, we'd done work at the White House and House of Representatives, and we tried to pull some of the government-specific things that were developed therein. Um, and with Open Publish, we actually got uh, we actually got a contract from Thomson Reuters, who had a, developed a technology called uh, Calais, which is a, which is semantic uh, metadata processing. And they were looking for 
a way to integrate that into Drupal, and we did that, and then we released that as part of the distribution. So I guess we have done a little bit of both, and then Karen mentioned the development seed story with regards to Open Atrium. So I think there's a lot about probably four or five different ways that these things get built, and I guess I'll let one of these guys talk about I mean, Aqua would be another example of how it's done. Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting question. I think that uh, you know, long term for a sustainable distribution, you have to have um, an ability for the maintainer to monetize that, and the monetization of that could be your domain expertise. Um, in my role at Acquia, a lot of people come to me with their distribution ideas, and just over the last couple of days, there's been some uh, really really interesting ones, including things like urban planning and real estate, etc. But the core base of that is that those organizations have domain expertise there, so they're looking to monetize it and, you know, obviously add value through that. Um, at Acquia, you know, we've, we've basically done all three. I mean, we've, we've done the seed funding. We do a lot of client work with our professional services to augment that. But I think the, uh, the key one is the third that's listed up there, and that's community involvement. I think for all of us, um, you know, Drupal in general, but uh, distributions, distributions in particular, we've got to get much more community involvement across the board, across all distributions, to really see these things take off. Do you want to chime in on that? Well, when I guess one comment I would have is that, um, is that anyone really can build their own distribution, and it's just a matter of uh, if you think there's a need for something that replicates more than once, essentially. So, um, so I think it's, it's more about your use case and trying to define the exact sort of uh, the, you know, place where that needs to happen within your organization. So. Uh, I mean, I think the way we came to it is a little bit of a common theme that we learned to start doing Drupal back in 2008. And we we're trying to figure out what are the modules we're supposed to use, how are we supposed to put this together. We were building a lot of, we built a lot of corporate sites, marketing sites, things along those lines. And it was a way for us to sort of codify our standards. Um, instead of documenting, we codified it into, and in, in the beginning, it was just a database dump and a bunch of modules. And then I said, hey, why don't we actually turn this into a distribution, which was insanely hard back in those days. Um, and so the, and then, you know, eventually features came along and then apps and things like that to make it easier. But it really just kind of came out of uh, trying to be more efficient for our clients and starting to codify that. Yeah, and to just jump in there on, on specifically the conference organizing distribution, it's interesting because it, I would say it's, it was primarily funded by client work through, uh, you know, historically through the company GVS, which is now part of Acquia. Uh, but initially it started out, uh, well, the Drupal 6 version, I should say, started out here in, in Denver for Drupal Camp Colorado. Uh, and there was a community effort to build that site in a way that contributed features back towards the distribution. And that kind of provided a, a base for, uh, for some other folks, but in particular GVS to then go out and uh, hire, you know, sell consulting work essentially that resulted in contributions. And so at first COD wasn't particularly feature rich, but then we added the schedule view um, and, and, and other features that, that are now key parts of the distribution. Um, so at the same time, uh, some company funding went into moving some of those things along. Often if you contribute code back from a client project, you kind of need 10% more time to just button it up and get it into a state that it's really generalized and ready for community contribution. Um, so definitely agree that having all three of those is, is uh, a solid way to build a distribution. Um, which brings us to our next question. How do you measure the success of your distributions? This is a tough one. Um, and yeah, it looks like Mark is eager to answer. Oh, Mark is eager to pass the microphone to someone else, I see. <laughs> this was actually a running joke before we all got on here, um, so I was handing it to Karen, but um, since I no, have it, yeah, it. exactly. That's actually a really tough question because it, uh, it really varies based on the distribution and based on the, um, uh, the intent of that distribution. I know that uh, the maintainer of Elms, for instance, is out here. And, and that's an e-learning management system that uh, is for Penn State. So success for them is obviously deployment internally at uh, Penn State and success there. Uh, for Commons and COD, for instance, internally at, at Acquia, we measure success a number of ways. And you know, we track the downloads, we track the growth, we also we, we tag um, in salesforce.com and so that we can tell from a monetary standpoint what the growth is there as well. So that is, that, that's one way, but also there's contributions from the community, and I think that that's that whole theme of community involvement again. So the number of commits from the community, the activity on the community and the forums, 
those kinds of things are, it's almost like the canary in a coal mine. If that dries up, you know, that's, you, you've got some work to do. So I think all of those together, it's uh, both from a community side and, and also from an activity side. Anyone else want to jump in? Sure. Um, so we see, uh, we, I re really like the term accelerator for, for um, distributions. It's a really good word for it. Um, one of the, I think one of the ways when you are thinking about how you measure success for your distributions, you have to figure out first what success means um, for you. And I think, you know, for us in distributions, um, there's two things that our distributions do for us. Um, they, they lower the cost of acquisition of, of our customers for our, for a sales perspective and a marketing perspective. Um, they bring us people because they, people see that we are experts in the space um, the, because of that distribution and because of, of what we've built and, and what's powered by that distribution. Um, so that's that's one way, and then another way is is it lowers the cost of our of our execution, um, and that's you know what Tom was saying it, is it helps us lower that. So those are the you know one of the ways that we look at um, our distributions and whether they are successful is is it bringing us people and and taking you know is it less time and less energy for us to go out and convince um, people to to build our, their sites for them, um, and is it is it making us more efficient? Does it take over, you know, does it take care of the first, you know, 100 hours of a project, 200 hours of a project, 1,000 hours of a project? Um, how much time does it save you and how much money does it therefore save you and how does it accelerate your projects, right, either from a sales perspective or from an operational perspective? Just, um, since, since we do a lot of this uh, in-house with our, with our team and um, I guess in theory I pay for it, uh, I, as I can tell you, that you, you really do need to put some kind of a return on investment. Um, look at total cost of ownership of these things because building them is one thing. Maintaining them it can also be very expensive. There's an enormous amount of responsibility in the community around doing this. Um, and since we've, we've not, not just doubled down but quadrupled down at this point, um, we're spending, last year we spent uh, about a million dollars. Um, it was a 1.03 or something like that. Um, I, I almost threw up when I saw it, but uh, it, it was done consciously for a number of reasons. And for us, a lot of the return is, yeah, it's in, it's in acquisition of customers, it's in sales, it's in marketing, but it's also a way to provide our developers uh, uh, a release from the day-to-day -day of, of building, you know, heavy, heavy deadline-driven websites. Um, so it's a nice way to get them involved in the community, to help them build their own contributions, their own personal brand, and also get to do something other than their project work. So the problem, and my point, I guess, in measuring it is these are very intangible things, and yeah. they're very difficult to put a price on. And when you're trying to recruit and retain uh, a high-quality workforce in this, in this uh, subset of the market here, um, you have to think about some value there as well. And we're looking, and right now, and Karen has been charged with it, but we're looking at ways of monetizing, or not monetizing, but really quantifying all of that so that we can actually have a measurable return on investment. And we know when we put you know, an hour into open public, we know exactly what we get back as a company. Um, but right now, that you can really only do it from a sales perspective, I think there's a lot more benefits than just sales and marketing. Uh, you know, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Some of the same things that uh, Jeff's talking about is really I, there's kind of three vectors that I think we look at when we say the success. Um, when you start these projects, it's really we're a bunch of developers. It's our art. Um, we want to make something really cool, um, and you don't always get to do that with your clients. So you've got kind of this time. And then there's the altruism side. It's really kind of neat when people come up to you and say, "Hey, I built this really cool thing. I used your tool." In fact, we we went around looking at some of the things we're seeing, like these wedding sites coming up and some really cool stuff that's being built. But then eventually you start to realize that, okay, well, the art part of it and the altruism part is great when you get started. There's this really heavy maintenance cost. And so eventually you've got to figure out some way of, of, of making it financially viable. And uh, we're sort of trying to figure that out ourselves as we go along. Yeah. Um, and so very related to that long-term maintenance is getting uh, contributions to a distribution from outside the company that's the main uh, sort of sponsor or funder of that distribution. So have folks on the panel had success encouraging those outside distributions? And you know, what are your secrets to getting people to contribute? Hot potato microphone up here. No kidding. Um, well, 
this is actually something that really challenged us, um, to be really honest with you. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it and say we've done a perfect job of this because we haven't. Um, we actually got almost into a place where um, we were a little bit closed in the way that we were developing our distributions. Um, we didn't make it very easy to contribute to. Um, we, didn't, we, didn't, we had a, a, a very um, internal theme and that was really difficult to sub-theme. Um, so it was very hard to contribute themes and sub-themes, hard to contribute to the modules or really be involved in the builds of it. And it wasn't very easy at that point because distributions weren't on Drupal.org and the issue queues weren't there. It was really hard also to, it was really hard to manage that process. Um, and we really got into a place where we became very reactive. To um, the to the community and not uh, and not proactive, um, and if if anybody heard um, Ryan from Commerce Guys yesterday talk about how they got started with commerce um, and the way that they that they encourage community contribution with commerce, it, it it's a much more proactive um, method, and, and they're very very involved in getting people in. Now we've taken once you know when we rebuilt on D7 when we um, when we started you know now that the everything's kind of moving to Drupal.org and we've got every you know all the issue queues there and everything's there. Um, we're starting to see a lot more contribution. Um, we put a full-time community manager on just to work on this, um, just to work on getting people involved and contributing to and developing with the distributions. We ramped up our, um, our um, documentation and training uh, information just a huge amount, um, all in an effort to really get more people involved and more people working on um, the project, we've seen a lot of success with that, with the apps and app server module, um, with level 10 and uh, Media Current and some other companies um, really coming in. So we're starting to see the fruits of that labor, but we really had to make a shift from being reactive to proactive um, in, that, in that department. And, and that's something, that's a, that's a lesson we learned from the, from the early days of distribution building. Yeah. Just want to just want to tag on one like very uh, important point Karen made there is some of that has to do with people what has to do with reaching out to people and sort of being a company versus part of the community and all that but there is a, some very real differences in the way distributions used to be built versus the way they're starting to be built and should be built now and that has to do with the packaging of them um, and 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 how heavy they are as a tool. When we built stuff on uh, Open Publish, for instance, on Drupal 6, it was a very large uh, set of modules. There was a lot of custom stuff. There was really no way anyone could make contributions to it other than just send us patches. And so now what we're doing is we're pushing it all back on Drupal.org. And you can take an issue for your distribution and move it back in the issue queue to the actual module. Um, and the distros themselves are getting lighter, so there's less stuff in the distribution. It's more of a, uh, sm it's a smaller core. And then the third thing is using something like apps or features to provide uh, more flexible extensions to these things so that people could actually contribute in an app or modify an app and then have that not even need to be in the download because the apps module will allow you to actually pull that stuff in when you're doing installation. So you don't have to roll a whole new release anymore just to get updated functionality. And that's a huge change in the way these things are being built. So I, I think maybe Tom has more on that too. Well, I mean, I mean definitely. The, uh, in fact, we, we pretty much had abandoned our distribution back before features came along. And then even with features, it really wasn't as flexible as we wanted. And apps has really gotten it to where we were really hoping years ago. But I guess, you know, getting back to the, the original conversation, we're just starting to get into community involvement. Um, one of the things that we're actually using our distribution a lot for is teaching. Um, we do a lot of work with the Dallas Drupal user group. We do a lot of beginner stuff. And so um, I think doing things like uh, having app sprints and sort of teaching people best practices and seeing, hey, if you guys come up with some good stuff coming back, we've had several people come up to us at this conference um, and ask about uh, getting things on our, app, on our app server and so forth. So we're kind of new at doing it. Anybody yeah. else got a comment? Okay, so, so I actually would like to talk a bit about both Commons and COD. Um, COD was always developed on Drupal.org. Um, uh, Commons historically was developed on GitHub, and so um, shortly after I joined, um, I started an initiative to move the development of Commons to Drupal.org. And that started around uh, last summer, so around August of 2011. And so what we've got here is a graph of issue queue activity for Commons. Um, and what you can see here is the number of users commenting, filing new issues, and then what's really key here is the total number of non-Acquia attachments. So 
Drupal.org uses a patch workflow. And what I've done in this graph is subtracted the Acquia team patches. And so what you're seeing in the, the yellowish, orangish line, is, which is probably not very distinguishable on this projector, is uh, it's this one here, uh, is patches filed by people outside of Acquia. And so what you can see is, as soon as we move development to Drupal.org, essentially, right after that, there's a huge spike in the number of outside patches. And, and I think that that's pretty straightforward. It's not really surprising. Um, Drupal.org has a set of conventions around contributing code through the patch workflow, through the issue queue. And so you know, GitHub is a, an amazing system. It's transformed the way we work on software. But it's, it's not really the standard way of working on Drupal-specific software. So once we adopted that convention, we saw a really big uh, increase uh, in, in outside participation. And this goes through February. And as you can see, the number of unique users, so this is not the number of comments, but the number of unique users commenting in the issue queue has only, has only increased. So that was a huge benefit for us and for everybody using the comments distribution. Um, on an architectural note, uh, one thing that I think is, is pretty successful as an approach is to, and this is sort of related to apps, is that you want as many of the components for your distribution outside of that project and living as independent projects as possible. So the conference organizing distribution uses a module called UC Signup to integrate, to provide the smooth checkout workflow that integrates Ubercart's e-commerce functionality with the signup modules, attendee management functionality. And, and this is a graph of usage statistics comparing the conference organizing distribution with UC Signup. And what you can see here is that UC Signup has over double the number of reported site installs. And the benefit of that to COD is that um, that's twice as many developers, twice as many sites, theoretically, contributing patches towards UC Signup, which still benefit COD. And so by taking those components, those key components, out of your distribution where possible, building them in a way that's generalizable and not specific to your distribution, you increase the potential audience of people who can contribute. Um, and so, of course, not shown in this graph is Ubercart, which has an install base of something like 10,000 sites. And so, of course, there's even more uh, folks contributing to Ubercart. And all of those enhancements to Ubercart come back and benefit COD. So the real um, the message here that I take away from that is, as much as you can, get those components out of your distribution um, as much as possible. So uh, our next question uh, brings us to some exciting news in the Drupal world. Uh, as you may have heard recently, Phase 2 and Treehouse Agency recently merged. Uh, two leading Drupal shops. And so two questions related to that. First of all, congratulations. And second of all, uh, two questions that you can sort of answer together or separately uh, as, as you like. First of all, how will this merger impact um, the work on distributions that, that phase two is doing? And then secondly, uh, it, it seems that there are some uh, different technical architectural preferences that the two companies have in some areas like boxes and and, um, and, and Bean and things like that. So how do you reconcile those? I mean, do you, do you use them both where they're best appropriate? Do you, are you gonna try to standardize on those approaches or have you, you, know, have you thought about that yet? Um, no, we haven't thought about anything at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was just a spur of the moment decision. No, um, seriously, um, this, is, uh, this is a really hard question, but I think a really important one for, for us and, and frankly for me personally. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I had mentioned earlier is when, you, when you're when really trying to get the best people in this space from a development perspective, um, having innovative projects they can work on is critical because smart people don't don't rest on their duff. They, they need things to do. And so product innovation was a natural part of how we got good people and how we kept those people happy, excited, interested, involved, and all that. And I think it also was the same thing at Treehouse. Um, they have a lot of uh, contributors and people who innovated a lot of modules. So the question becomes, how do we pull those things together in a way that makes sense? And we've got uh, very real examples. Um, we, you know, we work with something called boxes. They work with something called beans. They do similar things. There's, you know, Could a you put the beans in a box? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to come up with a can of beans. Yeah, there um, you go. So, so, um, so we have a very interesting challenge on in our hands. And one of the th ways that we're approaching this merger is we're saying, okay, if, can we really actually get the best stuff from both companies to prevail? 
And so what we've done is we've looked at things that will actually challenge us, um, and one of them is this distribution question. How are we building distributions? How are we monetizing distributions? And we're gonna throw that challenge to the combined team, and we're gonna say, as part of integration, the way you will integrate is not by trying to learn what each other does, but to invent a new way to do things together. And so part of the way we'll probably do that is we'll throw all the modules, all the distros, all the contributions up on a board and say, okay, which of these pieces fit together? Which of these pieces don't fit anymore? Which of these pieces do we want to rework? Um, and completely open it up and not try to just make them work on our products um, and make our guys work on their modules. Because something we've learned, and we learned this last year when we brought in Open Atrium, uh, we took on you know, features and context and spaces and um, you know, all these modules, we learned it's really hard to work on someone else's code, even if you have great developers. So what we want is this to be a joint effort. We want everybody to feel like they have ownership in this instead of just saying, okay, now you're on our stuff. So that's, kinda, that's the philosophy we have and the specifics of how we're gonna do it is probably a whole lot of closed door, you know, developer on developer, you know, intergalactic Olympics of the mind type stuff. So, also a, cage, also a cage match. Sounds like take, a great start. Take up boxing gloves. Do you want to add anything? Nope. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is for uh, Mike. Um, so Mike, could you talk a bit about how Intel, the Open Technology Center, has used COD and Open Atrium? Um, I know a little bit about this, or a, a bunch about this, because I had the pleasure of working with Mike on a lot of enhancements to, to both. Um, Mike is awesome. So tell us, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we got involved with um, COD um, around the Migo project, um, which is an um, open source um, mobile OS that um, our group at, um, in the Open Source Technology Center was working on. And uh, the, it was, you know, it's a developer community and they needed a conference site, so we got involved in COD to roll out, you know, two separate uh, uh, conference sites for, for two separate events. And um, in general, the experience was great. Um, I mean, I think what you find a lot of times with distributions is that they're not always exactly what you want, but, um, but that there are a lot of ways to customize them. Um, some, some distributions seem to make that a little bit easier than others. I think um, Open Atrium is a good example of the ability for a lot of the customizations to happen kind of through the configuration that they've already set up within the, within the, the distribution itself. Um, whereas other ones you might have to actually do a little more on the coding side, so you have to have some people that are experienced with Drupal. Um, but uh, in both cases I think there's, there's ways to do customization, uh, which is a big benefit for us because we always find that, that, that that's a necessity. Um, um, let's see, let me talk a little bit about Open Atrium and, and our customizations there, because I think that was pretty important. So we, we wanted to extend Open Atrium um, in a couple ways, and uh, you know, the way it's built um, is, you know, was kind of the foundation for the, a lot of the modern ways of building features. Um, and so it, it took a little bit of a learning curve to, to get um, some of the customizations in there, but um, once we did that, and we, we hired Ezra and, and Ben to do some of that work, as well as um, uh, Trellin did a, um, a feature for us as well. Um, and uh, it, it's amazing because uh, the integration, once they're set up, is, is just like it's another application within the distribution itself. It doesn't seem like it's you know, pigeonholed in there at all. It's really integrated well. And um, and that was really a big benefit to us because you know when you when you work with people that these are your end users that are using these systems um, and they're used to you know some are used to you know stuff that's not so great some of them are used to stuff that's a lot better in terms of using other uh, s software um, you need to you know raise the expectation and, and make sure that you're that you're that you're providing a good experience for them um, all around. So it's really important that that integration is, is tight and, and, and well done. Um, and so we found that with Open Atrium and then with COD as well, we had a really great experience with the, the, the organization, especially around um, 
the uh, managing of sessions, um, having, uh, you know, the way COD is built right now, which is with all the, the DrupalCon events, is that there's voting for sessions, but um, our model didn't quite fit that, so we had uh, built some customizations around allowing just a small committee of, of uh, people to vote on sessions, and then that would be ranked by a certain um, um, criteria, and then that was the, the way that they actually picked sessions. So that was a great example of like, okay, it didn't quite work right out of the box the way we wanted it, but there was this other way to do it, and it wasn't very difficult to sort of implement this, so. Great, thanks. And would you say that that level of kind of seamless customization is what led you to choose these distributions over something like a closed proprietary hosted service? Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, especially you know, around the, the conference stuff, um, the design aspect was, was very difficult to do in any of the uh, you know, hosted services or anything like that. So, um, and then having you know, experience with Drupal, it made sense to have it in, in that platform to begin with. Got it, thanks. So um, we, we discussed apps a little bit earlier and I wanna open the conversation about apps actually with a quote from Karen. Surprise quote. Um, so the quote is, you, you need only whisper the words App Store at a pub in Croydon to start a full geek on geek brawl about monetization in Drupal and its potential ill effects on the open source community. So, so obviously, <laughs> this is a comp. Obviously she had a brawl in Croydon. Yeah, it, was, it got ugly. Um, but this is a, it is a complex issue because you know, Drupal is a free software project and when we start, you know, people hear app, they might think App Store and think about selling. Uh, selling code, and so there's a lot of um, uh, issues that come into you know the sale of of code. There's also the idea of decentralization. So Drupal is a is a project that really values centralization around Drupal.org. So a lot of work went into, for example, adding Git support to Drupal.org to help curtail the number of projects that were moving out to GitHub, so that there would be one canonical place where you would always be able to find a Drupal project where the security team could you know, pay attention to that project and issue security advisories, or you have a standardized issue queue. Um, similarly, with the, with the distribution packaging was another effort to centralize on Drupal.org. So, you know, one might look at apps and app servers and say, hey, what's up with this decentralization? Um, and so I'm wondering if you see apps and app servers as a way, you know, as kind of an experimental area that might eventually move back to Drupal.org or maybe a mix of being on Drupal.org and on company specific uh, hosted services. Um, so I, I guess that's like 15 questions, but if you'd like to answer any of them, that would be great. I'll, I'll, I'll pass that to Tom since. Um, yeah, the, the whole app, App Store uh, issues is kind of interesting. We really look at it as um, it's just a great way to package and deliver things to the 99% of people out there who are not developers. Um, you know, to this point, we haven't done anything to commercialize any of our apps, um, and we've just built, it was just, it's just a great way of delivering things to us right now. Um, one of the things that we have done is actually all, almost all of our apps, I think we've got a couple we still need to clean up on this, but most of our apps we actually release on Drupal.org also. Yeah. Um, and so you can install them from Drupal.org, you just don't get all the automation of the installation. Um, and so, and of course, you know, and, and so that's, you know, also it helps to have the issue queue there and to be able to move stuff around. So there's a lot of benefits to all these things being on, um, on uh, Drupal.org. The other thing that's kind of interesting is, you know, originally when, I, when we looked at apps, I thought, oh, this is going to be this great, huge thing, and there's going to be millions of apps and so forth. And actually what I'm starting to kind of feel is a, almost a better approach, and really it's the, the approach that Phase 2 has taken, is apps a little bit more around your distribution. <laughs> um, and it's almost kind of nice to have less choice. I mean, we've got thousands and thousands of modules out there, and it confuses people. Um, and so, you know, and, but, you know, if, it, if uh, apps go on Drupal.org, which would be great if it does, we'll, we'll move over onto that. Um, kind of whatever makes sense there. Cool. Yeah, so just to touch on something Tom said I think is important from an architectural perspective, um, is, is apps, a uh, lot, lot of times, in fact, in every instance that I know of with our code, the app itself, the, the actual module, lives on Drupal.org as an open source module. The app's module itself just does packaging and delivery of that. And so even with the app server, the code itself, it's grabbing in real time from Drupal.org. So there is no forking or any extra sort of, you know, hosting of these, of these modules off-site. 
all you're doing is hosting the, the infrastructure through which the, the module or feature gets wrapped and then delivered into the distribution. And that's why I think there, it's not inconsistent with moving off of Drupal.org mm -hmm. if you keep that, that mantra. And so I think one of the things that, um, that we did around this when we saw that this confusion around app stores and apps was occurring is we actually worked with some people at Acquia, um, Mosh and, uh, and Robert Douglas, and some others to develop essentially an open app standard that would attempt to uh, head off the concerns of, of commercialization and not sticking with the open source mantra and all that. So we developed essentially an ethical um, you know, checklist, if you will. And so I'll let Karen talk about that a little bit. Um, right, so, so apps came around to solve a, a specific technical problem. Um, and then it created a, a specific small firestorm after <laughs> that. Um, and the, the technical problem it, it was trying, you know, we were trying to solve, and I, I actually think it, it really solves it rather um, beautifully, is we wanted to keep the distributions much smaller, and we wanted to make it, but we wanted to make optional functionality easy to install in the distribution. Um, it was a very specific problem. We wanted to bring open public. Um, when we were building it, we wanted it to just be just super, super lightweight. Um, really easy to install, very performant, um, and we wanted to be able to be able, we knew that a state government or a local government and a federal agency would not have the same functionality needs, would need different things, and we wanted it to be easy for them to install those and go, and go with it. Um, and that's why we built the module. Um, the open app standard um, was, was necessary once we realized that, well, if I want an app for, um, say, you know, constant contact, um, or something in my open publish distribution, and I go to Constant Contact and say, hey, I'd really um, love it if you could build a, a, a Drupal module and we'll, we'll make it into an app for open publish. Um, and they say, oh, really? Because somebody else just asked me to build a Drupal app for their Drupal you know, distribution or their different sort, and, and theirs isn't the same way. It's a different way. And then all of a sudden, these companies and integrations, people that we really want to make it easy to work with Drupal, are having to build these a whole bunch of different ways for a whole bunch of different kinds of app stores. On the other hand, we didn't want there to be like one major monster app store to rule them all and scare the crap out of everybody. So, you know, what we what we said is, let's just come up with a standard. Let's come up with a standard way of building these um, that means that there may be some actual interoperability. Some some apps might actually work in other people's distributions. Hooray! And if not, at least we're building them the same way and we're going to people once and saying, build this app and it, it could potentially work in different, in different distributions and we can do this one way. So a bunch of us got together last summer um, and built an open app center it's on drupal.org. It's a, on groups.drupal.org, there's a group for it. It's a really active group now. Um, there's a lot of people talking about it. Um, and if that's of, of interest, we try to encourage people to have um, less pub brawls and more talk on drupal.org. It's great to see collaboration around that standard, yeah. Okay, just a show of hands, how many people would like to ask a question at the end of the session? Okay, so we do have some questions. So let's do one more, um, let's do one more official question and see where we are in terms of time. So what are you most excited about in terms of distributions over the next six months or two years or as far into the future as you, you think you can see? Well, you know, I. I since I've got the mic, you know, six months to two years, um, framing it in those time frames and extending past actually I think is, uh, is, is more appropriate because I think, you know, Dries did a blog many years ago talking about how distros can make a difference and in the marketplace and it's really something that um, as the distributions mature and the group that's up here now all have, uh, you know, very relevant distributions for the market. So. Um, the, the, the whole open source movement has moved into the corporate mainstream. So you can go to a CIO now, and actually they may look open source first. Having a distribution that hits a vertical market, and let's call it a solution for this, uh, for this purpose, um, and with uh, community software being commons, for instance, if someone's looking at social business software and there's a handful of proprietary vendors out there, it's good for Drupal and it's good for, for commons to be in that, in that mix. The same CIO is not going to look at Drupal alone without the solution that fits that use case. Um, there are many, many use cases for commons, for instance, where the door is open for Drupal and they decide you know, to build it themselves, but Drupal still wins. So I think the excitement that I would see going forward 
is the maturing of the application of the solutions and maybe the, uh, the maturing of the application market as well, the apps market. But uh, you know, the more that these uh, become mature, and I, I'll focus on commons, it's really causing problems for the proprietary vendors. And by getting in there, it just opens up a broad opportunity for Drupal in general. And uh, you know, a lot of things I get excited about, same, some of the same things that Mark's talking about. Um, you know, Drupal, if you're a developer and you've gone through the learning curve, is awesome. It's this great erector set, but the rest, most of the world doesn't want an erector set. Um, in fact, a lot of times we've lost deals because someone was looking for a calendar and they're like, oh, I'm gonna just go with this thing that already is a calendar, not something that has to be morphed to, to turn into a calendar. Um, and the thing that I get really excited, and particularly around the apps part of it, I mean, to me, it's kind of hard to, to break apart apps and distributions, is that um, we now can build these purpose-driven projects where people get what they want but they still can break it apart and have all the great flexibility of Drupal. Um, there's a great article that, uh, actually the Blue Drop Awards, they had on, on one of their blog posts that, uh, I forget who it was, but it was a magazine that said that uh, another CMS had won the CMS war because they were really good at tailoring what they do to bloggers. And that's the one problem is we're tailored to developers, and developers are actually a very small part of the world. And so that's, that's where I get really excited. I think we're gonna see, see, see these distributions really opening up new markets. We already have, I mean, with a lot of your guys' stuff. Uh, I think I'll say that um, I'm excited to hear that more of the distribution infrastructure is going to go to Drupal.org and, and there will be more community participation around that. Because once you invest in a distribution um, and your users are using it actively, it's, it's really, it really becomes a critical part of your, of your business or your group or whatever. So having the ability to participate more, to push the, the uh, distribution along, to make sure that it's not gonna be abandoned is really important and you feel like you're a, a little bit more part of that project. Yeah, I would, I would add um, one, one thing that's always discussed in, in the context of this and that's um, figuring out some, some of the really interesting business models around these things too. So, you know, can you, there's lots of people out there doing SaaS versions of these things. Um, there's people out there providing support, um, training, you know, design customizations, uh, custom themes, you know, apps, all these different things. They all represent new marketplace opportunities uh, that are potentially interesting for both people who are contributing to them as well as the people that have maintained them. So we're really excited about that and, and it's gonna be probably the big topic um, I think for the next year or so around distributions. Well, because you haven't had enough colorful analogies for me today, I'll tell you the one that um, is the best way I can describe why I'm excited about distributions for the next two years. Um, I kind of think of distributions as a, the, I think distributions are in a place right now where they are finally about to be a, a, a great thing in the community as, as open source projects, um, and then about to be part of something bigger than that. Um, I, think, I think that my job as a director of products has really been uh, really the director of distributions, um, and I think going, taking that step from, from distribution to product is, is it something that's coming uh, in, this, in this space. Um, and my colorful analogy for it is that I kind of think of distributions as holding a handful of toothpaste. And it's, it, it, it works, it, you know, it does something really good, it does exactly what you need it to do, but nobody wants to buy a handful of toothpaste. It's, there, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to sell a handful of toothpaste. It can be the best, to, best toothpaste in the world, but nobody's gonna buy your handful of toothpaste. So what the other things around it, the, you know, the tube of toothpaste and the tools with it and the things, that's what makes it truly a product. Um, that's, those are the things that you can wrap around a distribution to make true web applications and to make real products in this space. Um, products that let people do really amazing things with these distributions and products that um, power, make Drupal power really big things um, on the web. And I think, I think we're just getting to the point where we're seeing that. We're just getting to the point where we're seeing distributions mature enough, get enough contribution from the community um, to really start to step out um, and be the cornerstone of really great products. And that's what I'm excited about. That's a great way to think about it. If you just bought a handful of toothpaste, by the way, you can get a refund at registration. <laughs> okay, so um, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, I know a, a number of folks had some questions. I want to make sure we make time for that. Is that mic on over there? Um, you guys have obviously been involved in some really successful distributions, but I was wondering if you guys have any experience with 
maybe you guys put some resources into a distribution that never got off the ground or you decided not to do and any lessons that you guys would have about that as far as somebody thinking about doing a distribution what did you learn from maybe say quote unquote a failed project yeah so uh, uh, this is this is my pure moment of total honesty uh, which which will probably I'll re I will regret later um, <laughs> so uh, we have a fifth distribution I don't like to talk about it much um, it's called Tatler and uh, Tatler is actually really really cool it's, it's, it is the number one requested distribution that we have. It has been downloaded an enormous number of times. Um, and it does something really cool. It does topic monitoring on the web for things that you put in. And it uses semantic algorithms to kind of uh, bring in information. It creates feeds and brings in all this information. And it's in a Twitter-like interface, you can look at all these things. Well, we learned a couple things in the process. In fact, we hired Karen when she pointed out that it was flawed on a num number of levels. Um, one, uh, the technology, it just wasn't, it was a terrible fit for Drupal, PHP, and Cron. Um, it just bringing in that many feeds, that many mentions, and deduping and dealing with feed integration was a very difficult problem to put out as a distribution. If you have a server and you know how to do all this system administration stuff and you really understand you know, performance and things like that, then you could run this thing. But if you just open source it as a distribution and you hand it out, to any you know, marketing guy on the web who wants to market stuff for his clients, they don't have the technical sophistication to maintain something like that. Huge mistake um, for us because we, it looks so cool, but it's so hard for people to administer. Um, that doesn't make a good distribution, I think, to Tom's point. Second thing was um, there are so many commercial alternatives out there that do a better job. And we did it our best that we could do for free in Drupal and put it out there. But all at the same time, these products were all the rage. You got Radian 6, and there was one called Viral Heat that was, you know, it was, you could go do a SaaS version of it for, you know, 15 bucks a month. Um, or you could download our free distribution, spend twice that in hosting, never be able to configure and manage it and be frustrated with the results you were getting and yell at us even though it was free. Um, so both the business model and the technology were flawed. We have not decommissioned it because it's a contributed thing. We want people to see what Drupal is capable of doing, but it was a bad choice for a distribution. Thanks for that answer. Okay, uh, is that good? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, two questions here. Um, one, will the distributions uh, hosted on D.0 go through the same security evaluations that contributed modules and themes currently do? And then uh, also, base distributions with apps connected as an a la carte approach. Uh, this means the standard is of the distribution is broke. So uh, how do you deal with support and maintenance long term in that approach? Sure, so I, I'd like to answer the first part. I think it's, it's actually um, not accurate to say that contributed projects are monitored. Um, it would be more accurate to say that, um, you know, there's the, I think that there's a sense sometimes that the Drupal security team is like actively patrolling Drupal contrib and looking at code. Uh, and in fact, they don't do that. Um, what, what, the way that it works is that people report security issues. I think that um, my understanding, and, and we have some security team members in the audience, of the way that it will work is that distributions will follow that same model so that if a distribution is packaged on Drupal.org and, and is available for download on Drupal.org and it has an official release, so same policy as for contributed modules, not an alpha, not an RC, but an official release, um, and a security issue is, is discovered, it'll be reported to the security team and a security advisory will be issued according to the same policy that, that applies to other projects. Is that, is that correct? Okay, so that's, that's, that's now a fact. Um, so, <laughs> With the we, we just made it a fact it's right in front of your right. eyes. Okay, uh, and so the next question, uh, you know, it, uh, let me see if I can summarize it and let me know if I've got this wrong. Is distribution maintenance broken when, um, when apps are sort of dis you know, not shipped with the distribution. Um, I guess I would sort of ask, what do you see as being broken about that model? Yeah, I think, um, and so, so the point was, that was made was that uh, you know, it's new that um, 
you can add something to an existing distribution. And, I, and if anyone wants to weigh in, that's, that's cool. The way I think about that is that it, it, in a lot of ways, apps are new, but in a lot of ways, they're also not very new, right? Like right now, there's nothing preventing me from re you know, releasing my app on Drupal.org as its own project, as people are doing now, and not having an app server. And so the added step of making those apps more accessible and perhaps more discoverable than they would be without an app server, I don't really see that as um, that dramatic a shift in architecture. Um, but let's see what the panelists think about that. Um, yeah, there, there's a few concerns around it, but in general, it's yeah, exa not that much different than um, just ha upgrading a module or upgrading features. Um, yeah, you normally have a lot more dependencies, and so sometimes those dependencies could break things. Uh, the way we kind of see apps being used is that you either have kind of the hobbyists that are going to install them on their Bluehost site and the live site, you know, and so forth, and hopefully they back up their database. Um, the more enterprise side of things, um, and we rarely see apps breaking things, but they do, just like modules do sometimes. On the enterprise side, you're going to deploy these things on your local machine. You're going to deploy them on your, you know, on your dev environment before ever pushing them up. Um, so, so far, there hasn't been too much of an issue, but you know, there, just because there's so many dependencies with other modules, there's a little bit more likelihood than with a regular module. All right, uh, next question. Uh, this is great. Starters, so thank you guys. Could you speak it to the mic just so oh, the folks at home can wow. hear you? Yeah, I really have to speak Shout. in the mic there. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, <laughs> could you post the slides from this? Because I recently went through and basically, I, I mean, I run a distribution. I went through and abstracted a lot of the code into, you know, more of the approach of, hey, there's just a lot of modules and we happen to assemble them back into one package. Um, could you post those slides? Because it took me a while to convince my boss why I needed to do that. And that one example with the, the graph with the UC Absolutely. is exactly what I've talked about and it had no statistical evidence personally to, <laughs> to do. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually planning to do a blog post with those statistics as well. So we'll, we'll post the slides, there'll be a session video, and then I'll write a blog post that includes some of that information. Awesome. Glad awesome. you found that useful. Um, so one minor thing for the audience, I've noticed a lot of people actually treating their own sites as distributions, which I think can help you get into that type of mindset of just how to develop it. It's a little overhead, but long term, if you gotta spin off the same thing for other people, it helps. Um, but two questions for you guys. Um, the, from the security perspective, um, I, I think it's interesting, but as you abstract this stuff, so then there should be security announcements about those individual projects, but your distribution is probably going to point to a specific version of those modules. So should you be waiting for the distribution to flag a security release, or should you be looking at the individual projects flagging security releases and upgrading? Because I've heard there's some potential issues involved. Yeah, I think that's probably, uh, so let me start to answer that question, and then we can continue to answer that question outside the panel, because I think it really depends on a per site basis. You know, in, in general, security advisories can be issued when, uh, when in fact, not every site that uses a particular project is affected, so sometimes there are a set of conditions that have to be met on a site for a particular vulnerability to be exploitable. And so if your site doesn't happen to have that set of configuration, um, you, you know, you're not actually affected. Um, I, I would say, uh, you know, an, I would refer you to the issue queue for the relevant distribution to get, to get the best answer about that distribution. And um, I think we should probably let, let uh, okay, we just sorry. have a couple more minutes. So those were great questions, thank you. My name's Dustin Boger. I'm a webmaster for a group out of California, the uh, Delta Stewardship Council, and we've embraced distributions on a couple different levels. One, we have a conference that we put on. Uh, we've used COD. We're developing that right now. And two, we're looking forward to Open Atrium to use that as our uh, intranet. Question I have, I guess this is for Jeff and Karen. What's the future migration process or timeline for moving Open Atrium to seven? Because we really don't want to have to do that on our own. We want to wait for it to come. So I was wondering what the timeline might be on that. I'm sorry, I believe we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, I'm going to just address that. Real, I'm really glad you asked that question. For us, it's very important. And uh, we, ha we do have some information publicly available in terms of a roadmap. Um, there's also a BOF occurring yeah, I'll at, be going to that one. <laughs> uh, one o'clock, and we'll talk about that specific issue. Um, I just want to say, in general, um, it Open Atrium is a great product on D6, and it works really well. And so, um, running right into doing seven or something like that never seemed to be really a pressing issue. It's something that people want because, 
you know, their developers have moved on to seven, they've moved on to seven. And so we're, we're aware of that and we, we're gonna address that and we wanna do that. But in, in, the, in the spirit of the other stuff we've talked about, we really want that to be a community effort. Um, and we're very much going to hold our ground this time and we're going to challenge the community to contribute uh, time and potentially money to making that happen because just rebuilding Open Atrium on Drupal 7 uh, as a phase two project is a non-starter. It's, it would, it would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars and I just can no longer imagine a world in which, you know, it, it, we put everything out there for free and nobody helps us contribute anything back to it. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense and it's against the spirit of this project and uh, we are going to have boffs, we're gonna have public discussion, we're going to call people and email people directly and say, what do you want to do in the migration to D7? And we've started that process with, um, with customers um, who are using it and we'll do the same with developers. So we really do expect that it will be a community effort. So, so do you wanna? Um, Michael, if you get a chance, I'd love to talk to you afterwards about your customizations to Kotlin. Yeah, and um, the other thing is that we'll probably be putting together kind of a core group of, of Atrium developers, of people that are really interested in guiding it. Um, part of it, of course, is the fact that it would be a very, very big build for one group to do. But part of it also is that Atrium is used in such different ways. Um, it's used as an intranet, it's used as a project management tool, it's used as a portal. It's, it's really used in, in just amazing, uh, amazing different ways. We don't want to be the only ones guiding the roadmap for that product. Um, you know, it, when you're, when, you know, we are happy to be leaders on that project, we're happy to, to take the responsibility for it and those kinds of things. Um, but we want it to, we really want the architecture and the vision for it to come from the people that are building it in such different and, and interesting ways. So we, it, it, it's really key to the, the strategy on Atrium and it's the only way that Atrium will move forward. Do you want to reference where the roadmap is? Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, if you go to community.openatrium.com, there's a blog post um, in, the, in a new group called, um, there's a new group on it called Developers um, that is for people who are developers who are interested in working on um, the next version of Open Atrium. And it's on, um, it's, there's a blog post that is from our technical lead, um, Patrick Settle, um, that is kind of defines our, our early vision for it. Um, and that's what we're gonna discuss in the BOF this afternoon and then um, in the continuing weeks to come. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to our panelists. This was a really great conversation. Thanks for the questions. Please fill out the session survey uh, and let us know what you thought so that we can improve this for the next time. Thanks. And there's some, uh, there's some distribution boffs this afternoon. I know that Commons and COD are having boffs, and I heard they're going to be awesome.